How do you manage global innovation? That's one of today's key management challenges. And a new book by INSEAD Professor of Strategic Management, Eve Doz, looks at this question of managing global innovation. He joins me now with his researcher and co-author, Keely Wilson. Welcome very much to uh, INSEAD Knowledge. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, the book is titled Managing Global Innovation, Frameworks for Integrating Capabilities Around the World. Quite a mouthful, but it does say the, <laughs> what it's about. Now, it's published by Harvard Business Press, um, and Booz and Company did some additional research with, with you, as we mm -hmm. understand it. Um, okay, in the book, you point out that global innovation footprints have been increasing steadily for the past three decades. All of a sudden, it seems as though it's on top of us. So what's been happening for these past three decades? I start with you, Eve. What's new today is really a reversal of the knowledge flow, which used to be very much innovation taking place at the center and then being diffused or projected into operations at the periphery to a new model of innovation, which is very much the opposite of this, which is taking innovative capabilities and new ideas and new technologies and new knowledge of markets from the periphery and bringing it to the center and integrating and aggregating it into an innovative offering, be it a product, be it a new business model, be it a new business altogether, be it specific solutions for customers. So this not only just reversal of the knowledge flow from one uh, origin, but from a plurality of uh, sources of knowledge where companies are really thinking of the world as a canvas with pockets of distributed knowledge you pick up from and bring back home or bring back to some location or build into a network, but basically manage a global innovation process which is not based on central innovation, but much more on innovating with distributed knowledge from the periphery. What, what did you find was perhaps one of the most common errors in, this, in, in organizing, or it's, it's one way of saying managing a, a global, uh, global innovation? Oh, it's, it's difficult to pinpoint one actually because there were there were sort of quite a few errors. Or <laughs> uh -oh. that, that, that I know it's, it's quite difficult um, that that firms made all the way from sort of senior management have to have a much sort of closer focus on what is happening in global innovation. They can't sort of make strategic decisions and stand back. They have to have a more day to day involvement, all the way down to the, the way communication is organised. You know, when you're when you're talking about cross borders, different cultures, time differences, it has a really big impact on how your people in various places talk to each other. I'm sorry. Go yeah, ahead. sorry. If I may add, yeah. I believe actually even upstream of how to organize, there is something which is a barrier in the mind, which goes to this kind of unspoken but very tacit and very powerful hypothesis, that the, or belief that the center, the country of origin, is the key locus of innovation. So I think first and foremost. Uh, what it takes is for senior executives and middle managers to realize that there is something to be learned from the periphery. So how do you capitalize on that? What, um, I mean, what does it take to truly manage a company that has a global reach or how do you realize that you need a global reach? And, and we're talking about more of an equitable distribution. We're not talking about hierarchy here. We're talking no, about exactly. a big octopus or something. Yeah, we're talking about the network of equals in a sense, in an ideal yeah, uh, well, first you differ have to recognize differentiated it. contributors, but equal status. Um, or what are some of the reasons that, f that companies fail to exploit opportunities for globalization uh, that, that has this innovative capacity to it? Is it, is it just lack of skill sets? They don't see it? It's too difficult geographically? Why do they fail? It's much easier. In a, we are here together now mode, uh, playing to the same tune than it is with very distributed units all over the world. Um, because I think the, the difficulty of sharing knowledge, particularly when one, one moves away from the scientific and mathematical knowledge into knowledge which is a little bit more complex, not complex formally, but a little bit more context dependent and therefore kind of complex socially. I have Cisco in mind there as an example. I was working with Cisco in Bangalore a couple of years ago uh, and they had a lot of trouble managing from Bangalore uh, a big project they were calling Cities of the Future, mostly because they found it difficult, although at the end of the day they were very, very much alike, but they found it difficult to have computer engineers, particularly female computer engineers based in California, to understand how Saudi women 
deal with the constraints of religion and behavior and so on, and how they were using social networks and the internet actually as a tool of uh, freedom, if you wish, in a very otherwise socially controlled environment. So the complexity was not in the uh, routers and the software which goes with it. The complexity was in understanding human between nature. yeah human nature and the differences of context between where the solution developers and the solution users uh, would be. You talk in your book about the complexity dispersion chart. Right. So that kind of goes into what you've been saying, but maybe you can both explain it a little bit. Imagine the chart, and uh, it's, uh, uh, it's showing on the horizontal axis the number of places you go to in terms of your drawing knowledge from. And it's showing on the vertical axis the nature of the knowledge you deal with. Again, at the bottom, you would have computer coding very, very explicit on mobile, and you have the, the famous uh, 24, uh, I mean, 8 multiplied by 3 multiplied by 7 uh, multiplied by 52. Yeah, that uh, needs no process. interpretation. It's yeah. pretty simple. At the top, you would have something at the top left uh, of something which is really complex knowledge and therefore has to be collocated, you would have something like perfume development. And we studied companies like Shiseido and more recently Amore Pacific, which were very successful entrants from Asia into, into a business which had been largely French and American. Uh, and they did it ultimately by buying or building uh, fully developed standalone businesses in France, which is kind of the home uh, of most of the perfume industry. So how do you manage to integrate and combine more complex knowledge at a distance? And there what we found is First, you know, you can keep the problem relatively simple as much as you can by not going to too many different places. So keep the number of places to, you know, as many as you really need, but as few as you can. That's principle number one. Uh, and that's one of the keys. That's what we call optimizing the footprint. Another key is, we touched upon it a little bit, is investing in communication. And communication is not just communication technologies. Think of it as the quality of communication. And then also think of it about, and then thirdly, think of the conditions of collaboration and apply to your own collaboration between various uh, technology centers or market uh, centers and so on. The same kind of care and the same kind of criteria as you would use in making strategic alliances work. So I think if you, if you minimize the problem by not going to too many places, and if you increase your capability to develop a new solution by communicating better and by collaborating better, that's probably the, the way to think about it. Kelly, maybe you can answer this. What kinds of people function well in this kind of an environment, globally diverse? Um, how, how would you develop that talent? That, the sort of people who work well are the people who we've, we've use this term sort of cosmopolitan managers, sort of bicultural people. So people who have a quite deep understanding of more than one culture, as opposed to people who've just sort of been on holiday or been on business trips. And the reason for this is they need to understand the, the context of where they're actually based, but they need to also understand the context of where knowledge is originating from. All right, so what do you propose? A couple of points. I mean, that's one of the most difficult. Professor, right? One of the most difficult challenges. The first one is um, keep some mobility of key people, but don't fall in the trap of the rotational assignments every three years that some multinationals have practiced, because that actually has completely uh, toxic side effect of it's people. It's disruptive, actually, and yeah, people give up on understanding local cultures, which is the exact opposite of what you'd like. Um, I think the other point is get teams where there are a sufficient proportion of bicultural people uh, so that they can basically train or coach or just act day to day in a way that becomes a role model for people who are we don't have this multicultural background and that helps the whole team work together much more effectively which has an immediate payoff it also helps some of these people learn the kind of cross-cultural skills better. I think it's not something you can teach uh, it in a classroom. I think it's absorb something it. you learn and absorb indeed in, a, in an experiential mode. You can run some workshops and so on, but that's something that has to be practiced. Uh. So what did you learn, the two of you, in researching and writing this book? It's hmm. a good question. A lot. A um, lot. <laughs> <laughs> right, a little no, more than that. A little maybe. more than a lot. I, I think one of the things that sort of struck me most was that this is, this is a really fundamental change in the way people do innovation. Um, and I think, we also, I think I also f learned that 
focusing on a sort of more globally integrated approach to innovation was actually much more flexible from a firm's perspective because they didn't have to kind of place bets in one particular place. They were able to sort of really look around and find where the best knowledge was and partner with a lot of external en entities, you know, all the way from sort of research labs, universities, government entities, all the way up to sort of other commercial entities. Um, so it, it was a sort of, I think, I think it's an, an exciting future um, and set of, set of challenges for, for firms to overcome, really. The other thing I learned is kind of at the other extreme. Uh, I was not surprised around organizational mechanisms and uh, communication tools and so on that I expected to find. Uh, one thing I discovered more of uh, is the role of people, the role of individuals, the role of what we are referring to as cosmopolitan or multicultural people, um, the role of the quality of interface really at the interpersonal level. So a very human and personal way of learning to work together in a global context. Can I end by asking you both the trends that you see in the next five to ten years in global innovation? Where are we going from here? Because you've pointed out it's taken us 30 years, but it seems as though all of a sudden it has sprung on us. Let's give me the next five to ten years. I, I, I think, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll focus on, I think, the roles of India and China. And I think the, the first wave of innovation in India and China was very much uh, sort of verification, testing type activities. And I think the next wave that we're beginning to see now is going to be innovation, very, very sort of high end innovation in those markets, which is going to have a big impact on how firms innovate and the sort of products and services that are available elsewhere in the world, I'd say. Yeah, that's critical. I mean, the other interesting uh, point is, you know, there's another, there's another piece of research I've somewhat been involved in with Booz, Booz and Company, and uh, it's around the shift of Chinese companies from, if we simplify a bit, from being imitators to being true innovators. Mm -hmm. Booz calls them need seekers, but essentially being able to identify new markets and new needs. Um, and I think if there can be some combination of, of uh, Chinese innovation and Western capabilities in the development of these new markets. I think everyone will win. Thank you very much, Kelly Wilson and Eve Doze, for being with us on NCAD Knowledge. Thank you. Thank you.